Now we've established that momentum is conserved in a collision, but is all of it conserved? Well, consider this. A, as we saw in the last thing, we had our two cars and a lot of students struggle this concept because they think some of the momentum must be lost because work must be done smashing up the cars. But if you think about it, it doesn't matter whether or not this force that's applying between the two cars is crunching it up or breaking them or denting them or doing anything like that. The force applied on B is the same as the force applied on A but in opposite directions and it takes place for the same amount of time so momentum is always conserved. Okay, and that is the key thing, that's a key take home message. Okay, is that momentum is always conserved. And I'm going to put a little caveat in there in closed systems. Now, talking about a closed system, that's just this thing here. Okay, basically, what it means is we have two cars. We're talking about the momentum of those two cars. When A hits B, Bosch, we're going to have momentum of A transferred to B. And so, and so momentum will always be closed, conserved. But if we think about an open system, this is a closed system, if you think about what an open system is, okay, open system A now drives straight into a cliff. Now obviously A is moving along, remember momentum is the product of mass and velocity, yeah, momentum P is mass times velocity. It's driving along, it's got some momentum, it's got some velocity, it's got some mass, therefore it's got some momentum. Bosh, it hits a cliff and stops dead. Where's all the momentum gone? Well, essentially, it's still actually, or nothing's really changed at all. If you zoom out of this picture to, you know, look at the Earth as a dot in space, as the car started accelerating that way, it pushed back on the earth, and the earth started spinning the opposite direction, and then when it hit the wall, doof, it stopped and it's, the earth stopped as well. But because the earth's so big and the car's so small, you just can't see it. Okay, so in a, it, momentum is always conserved, that's the full swell. But for some situations, certainly physics situations, you make the distinction between an open system and a closed system. An open system is one where it's interacting with something infinitely bigger and therefore it's not perceptible that the momentum is conserved. <coughs> okay, so that's open and closed systems. Now, let's just think about elastic and inelastic collisions. So, we've got this car here, as we've established in this closed situation, the momentum is always conserved. But will the energy be conserved? I mean, last time I had a car crash, the front of my car was pretty well kicked in. And basically, I know that it takes energy to break in or dent the front of a car. And so, whilst momentum is always conserved, okay, I'm gonna say always, and I'm just gonna leave that conserved. But, energy is not always conserved, okay? That's the key thing. So momentum is always conserved, energy is not. Now, there's two types of collision, elastic and inelastic collision. And an elastic collision, an elastic collision, is one where both the momentum and the energy is conserved. An inelastic collision is one in which the momentum is conserved, but the energy is not. <clears throat> so, where do we get inelastic collisions? Everywhere. Every single thing you can probably think of right now that it can involve something hitting into something else will be an inelastic collision. If you know about gases, you will know that the particles in a gas bounce around and hit off the sides of their containers. And if you did know about that, then you would know that that is an example, the only example of elastic collisions. Okay, well, so certainly at A level anyway. <coughs> so, Let's look at elastic and inelastic collisions. What is the key thing? In an inelastic collision, momentum is always conserved, but energy is not. Now, you have, you have degrees of inelasticity. Yeah? If there's some energy that's lost, okay, then they're just going to crunch each other up a bit and you'll lose some momentum. You can have what's called a perfectly, okay, perfectly inelastic. And a perfectly inelastic means that the um, two objects but there are two objects couple. Okay, so basically it'll be something like a blob of plasticine smashing into another blob of plasticine. This one's stationary, this one's moving with initial velocity V, 
uh, let's say they've got the same mass, let's just say they're both mass m, move the velocity v, that's the before shot, after of course the, the two blobs have joined together to make some sort of big blob of mass 2m and you probably can guess that because the momentum must be conserved the new velocity will be a half v or v upon 2. Now there because they start together that is an example of a perfectly inelastic collision. Okay, So you have a perfectly elastic and a perfectly inelastic but you well, basically you can have, inelastic is everything, if they stick together it's perfectly inelastic and if they lose no energy at all it's elastic. Now, <coughs> I seem to be losing my voice, <coughs> let's go into this, let's think now about perfectly elastic collisions and what they really mean. A perfectly elastic collision is one in which none of the energy is lost, you have the same the same amount of energy before as you do afterwards. So for a perfectly elastic collision, they can serve, conserve, there we go, <laughs> uh, both momentum and energy. Now that on its own right is pretty much useless to you. You'd be able to say, okay, I know the momentum before, I know the kinetic energy before, I may well be able to calculate some energy and stuff afterwards. But the real important, really, really, really handy thing to know about perfectly or in, perfectly, in, perfectly elastic collisions is that the relative speed of approach is equal to the relative speed of separation. Okay, so... relative speed of separation. Now, a great example of this is the whole way, you know how when they send uh, satellite uh, probes, space probes off to Jupiter and stuff like that, they do this thing called slingshot. So, um, <coughs> basically how that would work is you've got your big object, your planet mass M moving, with a velocity v, okay? And let's just say for the sake of argument, I don't know how fast the planet's going, just, let's just say it's going a thousand meters per second. I know it's probably going a lot more than that, but that's a nice easy number. You've got yourself your little your little probe, your little mass m, boom, 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 moving towards the planet. Let's say that's going at a thousand, mile, a thousand meters per second as well make the maths nice and easy. The relative speed at which they're approaching each other is of course 2,000 meters per second. Now what happens is this thing will go in, its path will be something like that, it'll get locked into a, uh, into a flyby and it'll basically swing around, slingshot off the gravity of the big planet and then fly off back into space. Now that is an example of a perfectly elastic collision, although they don't actually touch, it's the same principle. Okay, It could just bounce off the surface, you know that it won't bounce off the surface, but if the planet was a giant rubber ball and the, and the you know, space plane was a small rubber ball, boink, yes they would bounce off the surface and it would be close to being perfectly elastic. So, if this is a thousand meters per second and this is a thousand, that's the relative speed of approach is two thousand meters per second and this thing here keeps going, let's be honest, it's not really going to be slowed down by a tiny little space probe, it's a planet. So this thing is going to be whacking off and of course the relative speed of separation must be two thousand meters per second. So we get the situation now where the velocity of the planet afterwards becomes three thousand meters per second okay because before they were going together with a relative speed approach of that and that a thousand a thousand is two and now they've got to split apart but this is still going in this direction a thousand so this has got to be leaving at two thousand meters per second faster than it which means it's got to be going at three thousand meters per second okie dokie that's that first thing second thing where is it really handy now this is an example of a perfectly elastic collision because you can hear a tennis ball hitting a um a racket, but it's pretty close to it. Let's just suppose you imagine that a tennis ball hitting a racket is a perfect elastic collision. It's exactly the same scenario. You've got your tennis racket. It's a, <laughs> it's a beautiful tennis racket. It looks a lot more like a, uh, 
a, I don't know what it looks like. Anyway, that's a tennis racket. It's moving with a velocity, let's say something realistic, I don't know, 20 meters per second. Off. And the tennis ball, and there you go, piece artistic, is moving towards that 20 meters per second. Of course, if this was a perfect elastic collision, I know it's not, but it's close to it, then the tennis racket keeps going at 20 meters per second, relatively not stopped by the, by the, um, by the ball. And let's just say, I don't know, let's say it does slow, let's say it's going 20 before, and afterwards it's going at, say, 18. There we go. We'll have some conservation of momentum in there as well. Okay, so first it's going at 20, the relative speed of approach is 40. Afterwards, the tennis bracket's going, keeps moving, but only at 18 meters per second. We now know my ball must be leaving at 40 meters per second faster than the racket. So that would end up in going now at 58 meters okay, per so second and that's why tennis balls can go so fast a couple of very brief are. examples of how okay. to apply so, so that's elastic and elastic collisions uh, first thing I want to say of course all this is really handy the only thing you really need to know is this is that momentum before equals momentum afterwards you need to know this of course you need to know that this is called impulse but a lot of students really cling to this equation here m1 v1 plus m2 v2 equals m1 v1 plus m2 v2 and it's it's good but it's totally useless if you have more than two things and you do find sometimes there's more than two things okie dokie so i like to use this and then just apply it to every situation and oftentimes you, you do end up doing this but it's, this is really one of what i have in your brain <coughs> so this is first example, this first situation here, two trains, one's moving at four, it's ten tons, the other one's stationary, they're going to couple, they're going to collide in couple, which means stick together, and it wants to know what their resultant velocity is. Well, the momentum of four is equal to the momentum afterwards. The momentum of the first truck, ten tons, I mean I could change that to kilograms, but there's no need in this situation because I'm just working with a different unit of mass, which is going to come out of it at the end anyway. So let's say it's just 10 units of mass times by 4 uh, meters per second or units of velocity and of course 30 times by 0 is nothing so you can ignore that anyway but I put it in there to show. And then after so they've just stuck together of course that's 10 and 30 tons is 40 tons traveling at an unknown velocity v. It's going to be going that way with some new velocity v. Of course, 10 times 4 is 40, so we've got 40 equals 40v. Dividing 3 by 40 gives us 1 metre per second for <coughs> the new velocity. This example, much the same. Inelastic collision, perfectly inelastic collision. They're sticking together. But here we have a blob of putty at 2, two, two kg with 4 metres per second, moving at 4 metres per second, sticking to a blob of putty of 6 kilograms that has got no velocity at all. Same thing before, the momentum before and momentum afterwards are the same. Of course, two times four is eight, and six times zero is nothing, you can ignore that. And then afterwards, they've stuck together, their combined resultant mass is eight, and we need to know what their final velocity is. So that's the momentum before, eight kilogram meters per second is equal to eight V. There we go, dividing through weight gives us one. Now this one's a bit more interesting. <clears throat> this says a football player runs at 8 metres per second and ploughs into, these are the words of the worksheet, not mine, ploughs into a 80 kg referee standing on the field, causing the referee to fly forward at 5 metres per second. If this were a perfect elastic collision, what would the mass of the football player be? Well, what we can take from this, if the, the, the referee is 80 kg, so there's my 80 kg referee, and he's standing, which means he's dead still. The football player runs at 8 metres per second, so I know he's moving at 8 metres per second, and we don't know what his mass is, it's just m. Now, the key thing for being able to solve this is it's a perfectly elastic collision, which means that the relative speed of approach is equal to the relative speed of separation. Now, if he's moving at this guy at 8 metres per second, and this guy's stationary, the relative speed of approach is 8 metres per second, which means afterwards, the relative speed of separation must also be 8 metres per second. <clears throat> so in the afterwards situation, referee's moving at 5 metres per second, as it says there, which means this guy must be moving at 3 metres per second in the opposite direction. Notice it's a vector, it has a positive and minus, positive and negative um, um, representation. You can write negative, you can have negative values, that's what I'm trying to say. 
Uh, and so going backwards is minus 3 meters per second. Now, once I've got this, I can set up my equation using momentum. And this is the first, this is the bit most people just don't be, aren't able to see. Once you can see this, the rest of it's a piece of cake. So, momentum before equals momentum afterwards. Momentum before, of course, 8 times the mass of the unknown ref, uh, rugby player, football player, whoever it is, times by 80 times by 0, of course, so that we can cancel that, forget about that. And then it's equal to momentum afterwards, which is minus 3 times the unknown mass plus. 5 times 18, which is 400. Once we've done that, we're going to add 3m to both sides. We'll make that 11m is equal to 400. Solve 3 for that, and you see it comes to 36 kilograms. Okay, so that is a really handy application of this concept of conservation of momentum and as it is applied to elastic collisions. Okay, so for elastic, relative speed of approach equals relative speed of separation and conservation momentum applies. For perfectly inelastic, which is these two situations here, conservation momentum applies, um, but obviously energy is not conserved, so there's no separation at all. Okie dokie.